But I want to continue. Where I went to school, I've watched people, and I'm, I'm still young, but I've watched people take different divergent paths. And I appreciate being in ministry, being under a man, Pastor Alette, who's going to speak to us in a moment here, who continued. And for 44 years here, 17 of which I was a part of, I watched a man continue, and I want to continue as well. That's why I led the church and continue, theme for this conference. But continue doesn't mean static or stationary. All right, that equals stuck. But steadfast and strong in the truth from God's word. And I want to continue. And I'm challenging us as men and leaders, you know, my heart on this conference, uh, to continue to be a place, to have a place where worldliness is rejected. Last time I checked, the Bible still says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And I want to invite the world and love the world, but preach the world out. And worldliness to be rejected where worship is reverent. All right, and what a buzzword, the word worship. And because someone worships differently, we can't handle that sometimes. And that doesn't mean I'm going to change how I worship, but I can appreciate reverent worship. I'm Puerto Rican. I was in Puerto Rico for my grandfather's funeral about a week and a half ago. I love my grandfather. He was all the end of his life. And at that service there, a two-hour, 45-minute service, uh, they worshiped differently than we do here in Saginaw, Michigan. All right? They're Puerto Ricans. It's my heritage. And I had a great time. Wouldn't fit here at First Baptist Church, but they worshiped. And uh, I, I want to have a place where worship is, is reverent, where the word is respected, where there's a preeminence of the preaching of God's word for truth. And I, I love the fact of being in this ministry to hear God's word preached day, uh, week in and week out. I love truth. And last of all, continue where the wicked are rescued. Last time I checked, Jesus came to save, seeking to save that which was lost and is still doing the same thing. And I'm excited to be part of a ministry here who, who are still are active soul winning. All right, we're still giving the gospel, we're seeing God work and change lives. And so I want to encourage you throughout this conference today and tonight that you'll be challenged to continue. Hopefully there'll be some things that will be helpful to you, that will equip you, encourage you, and exhort you. And so it's my privilege, though, to, to, to announce and introduce my pastor, who I love dearly, Pastor R.B. Ouellette, who's served faithfully here. He needs no introduction, but I still can do it. All right, and one of the greatest gifts he gave me, all right, was not his faithfulness, so that was a tremendous gift. But in our, in our installation, Transition Sunday, he gave me an old Bible that he used to preach out of. That's a tremendous gift. I'm not telling you where it is because you may try to steal it. All right, but Pastor, would you come preach for us? I know we're blessing us this morning. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming to the Church Triumphant Conference. I'm delighted you're here. Open your Bible to the book of Joshua, chapter 22. And thank you, Pastor Howell, for letting me be part of it. I want you to know we always choose our theme at First Baptist Church of Bridgeport at the end of the previous year, sometime in the fall. And last fall, 2018, I said, Brother Howell, you're going to be the pastor longer in 2019 than I am. Why don't you pick the theme for this year? So the theme you see for our year at First Baptist Church was chosen by Pastor Howe. Uh, not only the theme for the conference, but the theme for our church for the entire year. And that's his heart. I have not been disappointed at all. Every time I hear him preach, I'm encouraged. Every time I get around him, I'm blessed. We talk frequently. And uh, I have the greatest confidence, respect, and gratitude for Pastor Howell and the way he's leading the church and honored he let me come here. I'm not going to read the chapter. I've got somewhat limited time and I'm not going to read you the whole chapter. We'll go back and look at it. But our text does encompass the entire chapter, uh, Joshua chapter 22. The fighting is done. The land has been conquered. The victory has been won. And two and a half tribes who said, hey, we'd like to stay on the east side of Jordan. We'd like to be over here, and their reason was real simple. It's a land for cattle, and we have cattle. This looks like a good place for us. It wasn't God's choice. Uh, Matthew Henry said there can be no doubt God intended for his people to inherit on the west side of Jordan. God never said you ought to go on the east side of Jordan. They just liked it. It looked good to them. And Moses got upset. He said, shall you sit here and your brethren go to war? Well, he said, you're going to do the same thing they did back in Numbers 14 when we didn't even enter the promised land. And, uh, and he said, no, you can't do that. And they said, okay, we'll go. We'll fight. We leave our families on the other side of the Jordan. 
Just give us time to build some sheep folds and some cities for them. And then we'll go over and we'll fight with you. Moses said, all right, if you come and fight, you'll be okay. But if you don't stay and fight, you have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. So they went. And they fought for about, according to most Bible scholars, seven years. They were faithful, their wives, their children, on the other side of the Jordan River, and they fought the battle, and Joshua said, good job. You did what you said you'd do. You've got a lot to take with you. Take your, your, your spoils that we've collected from the inhabitants of Canaan and go back to your tents. You'll find that word four times in Joshua 22. It's intriguing because the people who inherited where God sent them didn't live in tents. They had cities they didn't build and olive yards they didn't dig and vineyards they didn't plant that God had provided for them. It's always better when you trust what God will give you than you take what you can see right now. Always better. Our passage begins with a commendation. Joshua called the Reubenites, the Gadites, the half-tribe of Manasseh. Said unto them, you've kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. You've not left your brethren these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God hath given rest unto your brethren as he promised them. Therefore now return ye, get you unto your tents and unto the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of Jordan. Notice who gave him that land. Moses. Who gave him the land on the west side of Jordan? God. Moses said, all right, you can have it. Father, help me as I speak and say the things that would please you and help my brethren. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a commendation. He said, you fulfilled the commandment of your leader. You did everything Moses said to do. You did everything that I said to do. He said, you were fruitful in your labor. Uh, you worked, you, you, you got everything done that you're supposed to. You haven't left your brethren. You've stayed with them. I'm sorry, faithful in your labor. And then he said you followed the commandment of the Lord. You not only obeyed the leaders, you obeyed God. Good commendation. Then he gives an exhortation. In chapter 5, take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave unto him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. The exhortation is an exhortation to diligence. Be diligent. This is a big deal. Work hard at it. Uh, be faithful to it. And then he gives them some details. You can divide it different ways, but I'll divide it like this. Here's what, here's what I want you to be diligent to do. Number one, worship. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Pastor Al talked about worship. There are different styles of worship. I'm fine with that. I preach in camp meetings. I, I've been to meetings where the, the preacher didn't preach. I know because I was it. And people shouted and had a good time, got right with God. I've been to camp meetings. People got saved. Nobody was preaching. And uh, I like it. I enjoy it. I told our people about one of those meetings when I was pastoring here, and I, I said, you say, well, well, how much of that is real? And I said, about the same as you. I said, about as many of them shout who shouldn't as there are of you who should shout and don't. I like it. I, I, I've been to places where the music makes Bob Jones look liberal. And it's filled with the Spirit, and it honors God, and I like that. But worship, the word worship means to direct affection towards. When you worship God, you're loving God. Had to do with your worship. Love the Lord with all your heart. Had to do with your walk. And he said this, I want you not only to love the Lord, to walk in all his ways and keep his commandments. Two parts of that. I want you to obey the word of the Lord, keep his commandments. But I want you to know the ways of the Lord. God made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. It's more important to know God's ways than his acts. I told our staff when I was pastoring, you need to think like I think. You need to learn how I think and do what I would do in a certain situation. And if I would be nice to people, even though you're mad at them, you'd be nice to them. If I wouldn't do something, even though you may want to do it, don't, don't you do it. Uh, 
Joshua said, learn God's commandments, get his words, but get his ways as well. So it had to do with their worship, had to do with their walk, had to do with their will. Cleave unto the Lord your God. That's a determined decision. It means to cling. It means to adore. It means to follow, uh, to follow close. It means to be joined together. And the final detail of the exhortation that he gave them to, to live for the Lord was to work. And serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So it's a very friendly parting. Everything's really good. You guys, you want to go on the other side? God's going to let you. That's going to be all right. Uh, And we're not going to fuss at you about that. But we, uh, God said you had to stay and fight. And so they did. Now you did it. You did what you said you're supposed to do. And we're for you. Leave with our blessing. But not long after that in the chapter, we find a condemnation. Or you could use the word, there's a time of consternation. The two tribes, uh, Reuben and Gad and the half tribe Manasseh, cross the Jordan River and they build a great big altar. They build an altar and the Bible says, I think it's a, let's see about verse 10, they came across and they built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see to. What are altars for? What what are altars for? We're to do at an altar. Sacrifice? Worship? Are they to look at? Are they to be impressive? Are they to show off? That's not what they're for. They're to meet with God. That's what an altar is about. Man coming to God. Man being reconciled to God. But they built a big altar to see to. So... As we look at the condemnation that comes, there's an awareness. The other tribes on the other side of Jordan, it's a a very clear presence of this altar. They can see it from across the Jordan River. And there's a confusing purpose to it. Uh, The apparent intention, according to the ten tribes on the other side, is, hey, you're building another altar to worship God. You can't do that. God told us in Deuteronomy chapter 12 exactly where to build this altar and what we're supposed to do with it. When you read the book of Deuteronomy, I'm always impressed, and sometimes in Leviticus as well, how often God uses the word place. Go to the place that your God will choose. Uh, You've got to give your tithe at the place. You've got to give your sacrifice at the place that God chooses. And this was not the place of God's choice. God had given no instruction to build this altar. So the uh, ten tribes say, wow, you're already departing from our God and building another altar. Now, that wasn't their actual intention. Their actual intention was different than that. Uh, They're going to tell us that in a little bit. I'll come to that. And so there's an awareness and then there's an attack. It's somewhat legitimate. It does look like they are disobeying the command of the Lord. And their immediate reaction is, we're going to kill you all. Verse 12, the children of Israel heard of it. The whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against them. Verse 16, thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, what trespass is this that you've committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord in that ye have builded you an altar that ye might rebel this day against the Lord. And he on to mention other times in the past of Israel, a time of Baal Peor where there was iniquity and idolatry and fornication and judgment. And they, and they make an interesting statement. I haven't studied this out. Uh, you might want to study it out. It said, from which we are not cleansed unto this day. I find that interesting. I think that means that though God forgave them, the consequences of the sin have remained some years later. I think that's what that means. You can study it out and tell me if I'm wrong. So their immediate reaction is, we're going to kill you. But there's something really interesting, I find, in verse 19. There's not only an immediate reaction that we're going to fight you, we're going to go and destroy you. But there's an invited return, an invitation to return. Notwithstanding, if the land of your possession be unclean. Hey, did you get over there and figure out you shouldn't even have been there? Did you get over there and figure out that wasn't the will of God for you? Did you get over there and find that it's a pagan place and you didn't drive the pagans out like you did on the other side of Jordan? If the land of your possession be unclean, then pass ye over unto the land of the possession of the Lord. 
See the distinction? Your possession, the possession of the Lord. Wherein the Lord's tabernacle dwelleth and take possession among us. Hey, you can come back. Wow. In the midst of their anger, in the midst of their righteous concern that God's laws have been violated, they still invite their erring brethren to return. I tweeted one time, if you think somebody's leaning out of the boat, pull them back in, don't push them in the water. A lot of people are real good at pushing people out of the boat. <laughs> I'm not sure what good that does, but makes you feel special. I'm sure you're very righteous. But then, I want you to go to back a few verses. Not only was there an immediate reaction, not only did they invite a return, but there was an investigation of the reason. Verse 13. Remember, they're very upset. They're ready to go. The army is gathered. Their weapons are at the ready. But the children of Israel sent unto the children of Reuben, unto the children of Gad, unto the half-tribe of Manasseh, into the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the priest, and with him ten princes of each chief house, a prince throughout all the tribes of Israel. And each one was in head of the house of the fathers, their fathers among the thousands of Israel. And they came unto the children of Reuben, and to the children of Gad, unto the half-tribe of Manasseh, unto the land of Gilead. And they spake with them, saying, What trespass is this? That you've committed against the Lord, the God of Israel, to turn away this day from following the Lord. And that you've builded you an altar that you might rebel this day against the Lord. They didn't send the army first. They sent Phineas. Now Phineas was not a, uh, a mild, moderate uh, peacemaker. Phineas was the guy who shoved the spear to the people. Remember that? In, in the matter of Baal. Uh, he, he was, so they sent a strong man, a man who had a... a uh, a reputation and a history of standing for righteousness. And they sent one representative of each of the tribes and they said, what are you doing? So the two and a half tribes give an explanation. You find it in verse 21. The children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh answered and said unto the heads of the thousands of Israel, the Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knoweth and Israel shall know. If it be in rebellion or in transgression against the Lord, save us not this day. Their plea is to God. They love God. They worship God. They want to be identified with the true God. And they said, if we've done this in rebellion, then we deserve not to be saved. Save us not this day. And then they tell them their purpose. They make a plea. They tell them their purpose Verse 23, that we have built an altar to turn from following the Lord, or if to offer their unburnt offerings or meat offerings, or if to offer peace offerings of their own, let the Lord himself require it. And if you're not rather done it for fear of this thing, saying in time to come, your children might speak unto our children, saying, what have ye to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you, ye children of Reuben and children of Gad. Ye have no part in the Lord. So shall your children make our children cease from fearing the Lord. They said, look it, we're on the other side of the Jordan River. And they say, your children might say to our children, hey, you're on the wrong side of the tracks. You're on the other side of God's border that he has set, the Jordan River. And you're really not part of us and you're really not Israelites. And you really don't worship the true God. And there is on the part of the ten tribes then a perception. Verse 32, Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the priest, and the princes returned from the children of Reuben and from the children of Gad, out of the land of Gilead, under the land of Canaan, to the children of Israel, and brought them word again. And the thing pleased the children of Israel. The children of Israel blessed God and did not intend to go up against them in battle to destroy the land wherein the children of Reuben and Gad dwelt. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar Ed. For it shall be a witness between us that the Lord is God. Really interesting story. Let me give you some applications from what I think are germane to our day. The first thought is this. When you follow logic and reason rather than scripture, you'll always take at least a few steps away from truth. God said, build the altar. 
the land of Canaan. The Reubenites said, we're going to build an altar here. God said, inherit on the west side of Jordan. The Reubenites and the Gadites, half tribe and Asses said, we'd like to inherit over here. Now, they loved God. They were not idolatrous. They were not unbelievers. They loved the true God of Israel. They just wanted to do it a different way. A way that was logical, a way that was reasonable, a way that made sense to them. And my second thought is this. When somebody does something different than us, we tend to assume the worst. I've heard people describe a haircut like Pastor Howell, and many young men have, as a as just an expanded mohawk. I'll tell you what it is. You're, you're too young. It's just an old military haircut. That's all it is. They used to call them high and tight. Now, I didn't like him then, for me. I don't like him now. If I did that, I wouldn't have nothing. <clears throat> but I don't mind them for him. Good grief. Give a guy a break. His tie is skin. We, I, I shouldn't say this, but I, I found people listen so much better to the things I shouldn't say. The first principal of Bridgeport Baptist Academy, a wonderful man, dear friend of mine. One day he came to me and skinny ties had become popular. This was not the current skinny tie trend, but the previous skinny tie trend. It would have been about in the 80s. And he said, to Pastor, should we make a rule against these skinny ties? Our guys wore ties, uh, seventh grade and above, when they come to school. And I said, why? He said, well, you know, they're, they're the new modern ties. I said, Yeah. I said, you mean like the ones they wore on Dragnet? What's, what's Dragnet? Look at Joe Friday. Now, that was the previous, previous skinny tie trend. <laughs> like the ones I wore to Sunday school when I was a kid. Uh, the width of your tie is not a great indicator of your spirituality. <laughs> In fact, listen, I grew up on preaching against long hair. Now people preaching against short hair. When pleated trousers came out, preachers preached against pleated trousers. I mentioned that to Brother Howells. He said, yes. And they used to preach against them not having pleats. Because they said they weren't modest enough. You indecent people with your unpleated pants. Love thinketh, finish it. No evil. Always give them the benefit of the doubt. I probably shouldn't say this either, but you're listening well. <laughs> Kevin Wynn in Mexico is a good friend of mine. I love him dearly. Marvelous, amazing missionary. Brother Wynn adds, has support from diverse segments of independent Baptist circles. And some of his support came from a man who had some issues, uh, doctrinal issues. And he had some other people get mad because he was taking support from that guy. One of them said, I want the van back. That's, I want the money back that I gave you. And he called me. I said, give him his money back. He said, we got a van we use. We pay like three or $4,000 for it. And I, I can't give him that back. I said, well, I'll give you the money for the van. I'll pay for your van. Uh, our First Baptist Church will do that. And just give him his money back. And he said to his pastor, or the wind said to his pastor, look at, is it time to separate from this person? His pastor agreed there were problems and agreed there were issues. And he said, well, probably not yet. And he said something I'll never forget. You can always separate later. It's hard to unseparate once you separate it. Somebody does the, something different than us, we tend to assume the worst. That's what the ten tribes on the northern side did. Third thing I learned from this story, the first generation is usually less affected by compromise than the second generation. We're worried about our children. And we're worried about your children. We're worried about this border. And they're going to think that uh, uh, we're not connected anymore. Now, by the way, you check it out. The Jordan River was a natural barrier against the attacks of the enemies and the two and a half tribes on the wrong side of the river were a constant series of attacks. They were not protected from the enemy like those that were in the will of God were. 
You can, I, I see people and they, 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 they do things I would call compromise. And you know what? They are fine for the rest of their lives sometimes. But their kids mess up. Because their kids didn't have the same closeness to truth. Because they moved to the other side of the Jordan River and their altar wasn't an altar to worship at. It was just an altar to look at. And you'll almost always find a Carrie Schmidt in his book on music said that the contemporary church loses 96% of their young people. I asked him about that statistic, and he said, we checked it out because we get asked about that. He said, we got that from MSNBC. Not some fundamentalist trying to criticize the progressive movement. As liberal as you're going to get of a television network. Now, we don't keep all of our young people, but I guarantee we don't lose 96%. You know why? Don't get too upset about those rock and roll churches and the smoking and the light shows and the bands and all the stuff. Don't get too upset about them. You're going to be winning their members to Christ. I've been doing it. I, I wasn't going to tell this. I was on the airplane well, a while back. I gave a lady next to me a track. She just moved from outside of Chicago, Willow Creek, to Petoskey. And uh, she said, oh, she said, we were for years with Bill Hybels. I said, oh. That, what, what, I gave her a track. She said, it tells you how to be sure you're on your way to heaven. And I said, well, what did they tell you there you needed to do to go to heaven? And here's what she said. She said their weekend service were for the masses. She told me how many people came. She told me where the overflow went and all the stuff. She didn't answer my question, so I just didn't say anything. And after a little bit, she said, well, in the, the evenings, the weeknights, they had special groups, and they were more in depth. But she still answered the question, so I didn't say anything. And then she said, I guess they didn't tell us how to get to heaven. So I told her. And she prayed and asked the Lord Jesus to save her. Not the only experience I've had like that. They water down the gospel to make it acceptable to the world to a point people don't even understand it. Don't be too worried about them. They're going to keep going farther. But you know what happens? Young people in those churches find out the world does rock and roll better than the church. If you get them for the music, the world's got better music. I love our music at the church here. I'm so happy to be a member of a place with wonderful, godly, uplifting, encouraging music. But you, uh, you can win people to Christ without music. And we don't want the music to be the reason people come. We want it to be the preaching of the Word of God. First generation usually is less affected by compromise than the second. Next truth is this. You can always come back. Not many do. But you can always come back. I first had this thought when some of my brethren committed sins that disqualified them for ministry. I'd call them up, ask them how they're doing, let them know I loved them. And so many times they have said, you're the only one who called. Now, to be fair, they didn't call me either. But they feel isolated, ostracized because of their sin. And I always thought of it this way. I want to keep a bridge there so if they want to come back, there's an easy way to walk. I want to keep a connection there. You can always come back. Next truth is this. There's a biblical basis for borders. <laughs> there's a reason God told his people to be on one side of the Jordan River. It protected them from attack. You say, I, I don't, all these standards are all legalistic. You idiot. Everybody has standards. Let me come sing at your church next Sunday in a Speedo. Come on. At my age, it wouldn't be sinful. It would just be shameful. I promise no one will be led astray. If you need post-traumatic stress disorder counseling afterwards, but... Everybody's good. Don't you get honest. Good saying that nonsense. But did you know you can have no application of principle without some kind of guideline? Why do we have traffic laws? What's the one reason we have traffic laws? Safety. So why don't we just put big signs all on the roads? Be safe. 
No, we don't. We say drive this speed on this road and that speed on that road and this speed on that road because not everybody has the same idea of safety. By the way, all those guidelines have an element that is arbitrary. Why are all speed limits in multiples of five? You mean to tell me the exact scientific best speed limit is always 25, 30, 35, 40? I bet you sometimes it's 37.3. But it's easier to keep it if it's at a five. There's a Bible reason for borders. I read about a, some liberal thinker and they decided children need to be unrestrained and have more freedom. And so they, they uh, took the fences down from the playground. And you know what happened? The children huddled together in the middle. And they didn't play much. They didn't know how far they could go. They didn't know where the limits were. They didn't know where the boundaries were. They put the fences back up and the kids ran all the way to the edge of the fence. There's a Bible basis for boundaries. You better have some in your church or you're not going to help people obey the Bible principles you want them to obey. Next thing I learned from this story is this. Investigation should precede separation. Did you hear what I said? Investigation should precede separation. I uh, don't spend much of my time worrying about my brethren that are going different, but if they go public, if they try to influence people to go a certain direction, then I think it's fair for me to talk about what they publicly say because I'm trying to influence people to go another direction. And uh, I read somebody's blog a while back. He said at this time, I am majority text. Now, he wasn't. He was TR when he started out. He was King James when he started out. Uh, this allows me to use, and he listed all the Bibles he could use because he was majority text rather than TR. And then he said, at this time, I have no interest in joining the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, you know my main problem with that blog were the words, at this time. There's some things that are true for all times. Uh, uh, that's like saying, at this time, I have no interest in being unfaithful to my wife. I may meet somebody later and change my mind. I, I may later on decide that she's kind of ornery and I just want... No, no, you're just faithful to your wife. That's, and you just use the King James Bible and uh, you just stay away from entanglements with associations that have compromise in them all the time. Investigation should precede separation. I, uh, I was told the other day, I was preaching at a church in another state, and I was told that there was a meeting, <coughs> and a man I know uh, was kind of waffling on the King James Bible. Another man I know uh, stood up and, and told what he believed about it and was actually criticized by the man leading the meeting. Why would you say that? Why would you take that King James stand? Now, I'm not naming that man because I haven't called either of the men yet. I haven't checked it out. I'll check it out, and then I can say so-and-so said. So-and-so was at the meeting, and this is what was said. But I like what they did. They sent over Phineas and one from each of the ten tribes, and they said, hey, what are you doing here? Investigation should precede separation. I've had people all upset and just tell me the most awful stories, and if I believed what they'd said, I'd, I'd want to kill the guy. But to check it out, wasn't usually quite accurate. I was 15 years old. My dad ran the Detroit Rescue Mission, and he had a camp in the summer. I got to go to the camp. It was a girls' week coming up, and a young lady had come from a church in the Detroit area. Uh, she got there Sunday night after church. Camp was going to start Monday, and I liked her. Her name was Kathy Kapenka. I was, I was as tall then as I am now, maybe taller. And she was under five feet tall. We're sitting in a kitchen on a couple of stools talking. My dad walked by and he saw that every little bit I leaned down and kissed her. What would you do? You wouldn't find the door, you'd make a door. <laughs> My dad walked around the other side of the kitchen. And he looked at it from a different angle and he saw that I wasn't even touching her. She was short, I was tall, she was talking quietly. When she talked, I bent down my head to hear what she said. 
wonder what would have happened if my dad just barged in with an accusation. Investigation should precede separation. And here's what happens. You say something that's not quite right. You find out it's not quite right. And you don't even have enough character to admit you weren't right. You just defend your stupidity. I've seen that more than once. In print. The final lesson is this. You usually don't need to kill your brothers. I know the army's all ready. You want to go kill them? Go ahead. Uh, this is probably not necessary. Let me tell you, here's my observation. The other side, the side that's going away from separated lifestyle, going away from, and, and just let me throw this out there. Why in the world would you stop having Sunday night church? I was with a preacher in Fairfield, Ohio. He was an engineer by training, later went into the ministry. And, uh, and he's, he's just from nowhere. He just, you know, he fellowships with different people. He didn't come from any one particular crowd you'd be familiar with. And, and he said, the fact, he started out as a Southern Baptist. He was in the Southern Baptist Church before he became an independent Baptist by conviction. And he said, do you mean to tell me all the sermons I heard on Sunday night? All the truths I was given, all the decisions I made at Sunday night church, that I'd be better if I'd never had that in my life? I don't think so. I don't think so. But that side, the service-stopping, Bible-changing side, they tend to kill us the death of a thousand cuts. Little snippets on Twitter and little swipes in a blog and little criticisms over there. Our side does not do that. We're not so good at that. We just drop atom bombs on mosquitoes. <laughs> no tie? He preached without a tie. I don't care if it was camp. <laughs> you don't usually need to kill your brother. Well, the preacher said to go to about 10, 15. I think I owe you two minutes. I'll return it to you this evening. You know what I think? Uh, piano's going to come now, but we'll open up the altar this morning. I appreciate Pastor preaching with some great thoughts right there. Some truth from God's word. Appreciate his transparency, and I know it touched my heart this morning. So I'll stand, we'll stand to our feet, I'll pray, and we'll be an invitation. If the Lord touched your heart this morning, I pray you deal, deal with God. So let's stand to our feet as we pray. Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, thank you for that truth. Lord, thank you that you are gracious and merciful. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here, maybe who, whose heart has been hurt or has hurt a heart, and Lord needs that truth this morning, they'd respond to you. Lord, guide us out of invitation in Jesus' name. As the piano plays, the altar's open. you're here. Hope today's a blessing. A couple quick announcements before we're dismissed to begin our next session. I'll let you remain standing. Uh, the next sessions will start around 1030 and we'll start from the men in here with Pastor Chapel. That session I know will be a blessing. If you've not received one of those booklets yet, make sure you stop by a table in the lobby to get those notes in there from Pastor Chapel. That'll be a help. I cannot think of another Baptist church who is more organized, who is more thought out, 
and the principles he applies, God has touched that ministry and touched this man. And I'm so grateful that he was gracious enough to come here and uh, speak to us last night. Tremendous message last night. If you missed it, I would encourage you to live stream it and jump back on there. And then today, speak to us as well. And so that'll be in here. Mrs. Kathy Jackson for the ladies will be in the chapel. If you follow the signs, you'll find that. Or just follow all the, all the ladies, all right? You can hear down there. And I'm not saying they'll be loud or talking. I'm just saying follow the ladies. Uh, that direction. And uh, uh, wow, I might be in trouble, brother. <laughs> uh, and then throughout the day, uh, some things will be happening. One, there's a number on the screen to submit questions to. And if you have a question today, just submit it to that text number right there. And it's on the screen anytime, maybe during a session or while you're just thinking about something, submit that there and we'll handle those during our question and answer time. And then I think you'll be encouraged later on after lunch. Uh, we'll have Pastor Let teaching on invitation, some other sessions there. And then I've also invited Pastor Mark Monty, who's up here. Uh, some of you know him to teach us on some anxiety, depression, and, and panic, things like that, some mental issues, and how the Lord led me to do that. I, I saw a situation a few weeks back, a month or so ago now, and uh, through a, a variety of things, felt the Lord wanted me to bring him in as well. I think it'll be a help. Someone I was talking to said, you know what, it would just be wonderful if we just had somebody to talk to about this stuff. And so I don't know what the Lord's doing in your heart and life, but we have some help for that. I also have a, a man by the name of John, Pastor John Morrow here, and he'll be blessed. We'll talk about him a little bit later on. So we're excited. It's about 1021. We'll plan on getting started at 1030. There's a coffee shop still open and bathrooms out there. And so we'll see you at 1030 to start the next section. Thank you so much. Uh -huh.